Now to breaking news on the Russia investigation. Since President Trump took office, the Trump show has offered plenty of distractions. Breaking news right now. It was a profanity laced tirade. Steve Bannon is now out. But for all of the drama and the disappointment. Disappointed. Very disappointed. There's one achievement Trump can't be denied. My administration is putting an end to the war on coal. Gonna have clean coal, really clean coal. With today's executive action, I am taking historic steps to lift the restrictions on American energy, to reverse government intrusion, and to cancel job-killing regulations. He's made good on a campaign promise to repeal hundreds of federal rules. No agency has rolled back regulations more efficiently than the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, a government body created to protect health and the environment. Thank you, thank you very much. To lead it, Trump chose Scott Pruitt, a climate-denying politician from Oklahoma who's backed by the fossil fuels industry. It's good to see some coal miners here at the EPA. And who sued EPA 14 times on behalf of many of the polluting industries he's now supposed to regulate. We're no longer going to have regulatory assault on any given sector of our economy. That's going to end by the signing of this executive order. Pruitt has targeted dozens of environmental rules, from the Obama administration's signature plan to cut carbon emissions to bans on toxic chemicals. We've never seen anything like what Scott Pruitt is doing under Donald Trump. In this episode of Fault Lines, we travel downstream to communities with cautionary tales about what this rollback could cost. And by the way, regulations not only in this industry, but in every industry. We're doing them by the thousands, every industry. In 2008, Donna Lisenby paddled up the Emory River near Kingston, Tennessee, to the site of the biggest industrial spill in U.S. history. It was coal ash, the waste left over when power plants burn coal to generate electricity. I couldn't believe that a beautiful river like this that was clear and open and flowing was just choked with these giant ash burns. Six years later, it happened again. Donna found herself here on the Dan River in North Carolina. As more than 35,000 metric tons of coal ash spilled from a broken pipe beneath the pond where it was stored. You got a um, paddle forward? Perfect. The pond was owned by Duke Energy, North Carolina's main electric power provider. As staff for the Waterkeeper Alliance, a group that advocates for clean water, Donna went to assess the damage. That's the infamous pipe that spewed thousands of gallons of heavy metal contaminated coal ash waste into the Dan River all the way to Virginia. What did it look like when it was spewing? So it was just this really thick gray slurry. And as it continued to go downstream, the entire river turned this sick gray, and it smelled like cinder and ash. It smelled like hell. Oh, this is a coal ash right here? Yep, that's the coal ash. So we had to lean over to get that sample right out of that pipe. And there was no arsenic, there was no lead, uh, there was no chromium in, in any of the samples upstream. And then once you got here, all of a sudden, you had 37 times more arsenic. You had lead. You had, <laughs> you know, you had the suite of coal ash, heavy metals coming into this river. For years, many American coal-fired power plants have been dumping their ash into unlined pits, covering it with water and adding their wastewater too. The result was a toxic mixture high in arsenic, mercury, lead, and other heavy metals. The Dan River spill was a reminder that the pits could break catastrophically and that they often leaked into groundwater. After the accident, North Carolina's State Assembly passed legislation requiring Duke to fix, monitor, and eventually close its coal ash basins. To comply, Duke had to test the water on properties like Deborah Graham's, which lie within 300 meters of a pond. The results were unsettling. Hey, baby, can you bring me some of that water over here so I can make the coffee? Just sit it here another day. 2015, when my husband came in, the mail lady, she pulled up and said, hey, y'all, we, you know, I got something you got to sign. And I'm sitting right here drinking my coffee. And he's standing right there, and he, he's saying, the water's contaminated. And I went, 
What did you say? He said, our well water is contaminated. And, and I just remember this, this fear. And then I took the paper from him and, and I'm looking at it. I remember going right here to my sink, looking out that window. I had no idea. What's life without clean water like? You get that letter from your state government saying your water's contaminated. It changes everything you do. It changes what you do. It changes what you think about. It changes people don't even want to come to my house because they don't, they don't want anything from my house. Here's where it says, public health recommends that you not use your well water not be used for drinking and cooking. That's here. Tests in 2015 showed Deborah's well water had potentially unsafe levels of vanadium and hexavalent chromium, heavy metals that have been linked to cancer. This is the second one, this is June. But here's where it says the hexavalent chromium. Then in March 2016, a political appointee in North Carolina's Health and Human Services Department lowered the safety standard and sent out new notices. That's the okay to drink letter. We have withdrawn the do not drink usage recommendation because we had determined your water is safe to drink as water in most cities and towns across the state and country. Now Duke Energy won't admit anything, but I get bottled water every two weeks from Duke Energy. They say to give the residents peace of mind. I say it's to cover their butts. After the Dan River spill and more than a decade of work, the Environmental Protection Agency finalized a new set of rules. They had complicated names, but a simple goal, preventing coal waste pollution. There was the Coal Combustion Residuals Rule, which required energy companies to monitor their coal ash ponds and shut down leaking pits. In the rule Betsy Sutherland's team wrote, the Steam Electric Power Plant Effluent Guidelines. Our rule was designed to say, hey, you really need in the 21st century to start treating these toxic wastes and not pouring them untreated into these coal ash ponds. So our rule was really saying, you know, if you comply with us, you really don't need to have these coal ash holding ponds anymore. Sutherland was a senior official in the EPA's Office of Water and had spent 30 years working at the agency when she retired last summer. She was so dismayed by the Trump administration's push to roll back regulations that she went public with a scathing goodbye memo and decided to share her story. I wanted to warn people that they did need to be vigilant and they did need to be aware of all they're gonna lose in the next four years. Just weeks after Pruitt took charge of the EPA, he announced he would consider repealing the very rules Sutherland's team had written. The first we knew that he had decided to even reconsider the rule was when we saw his draft press release that said that he was going to grant these petitions, he was going to reconsider the rule because it had enormous job losses and enormous economic impact. I don't know why he said that, because at that point in April, we had never briefed him once on this rule, and we could have definitely showed him in great detail that there was not going to be any big job loss or any big economic impact. How does it feel that you put years into creating that kind of rule and then seeing it repealed so almost imperiously or quickly? Heartbreaking. Because we know that that rule was so important and so necessary to protect public health. The EPA rules would have made life safer for communities across the United States that live near coal-fired power plants and coal ash ponds. While North Carolina has moved to make energy companies clean up their leaking pits, there's evidence in many states of ponds contaminating nearby groundwater. Near the Blues Creek steam station lies a leaking coal ash pond, which Duke Energy has plans to drain and seal. Make sure this close, this close is good. Okay, well, the coal ash pond is over here. It's behind those trees. And them taking that out, is that part of them cleaning the coal ash? I guess that's what they're doing, I don't know. So it's like right across the street. But beyond that back pipe way back there, yeah. that's the pond. Andre Davis says that painful spots started appearing on her body about five years ago. Those are kind of the newest ones. Can you tell? 
How do you get these sores? Can you tell me about From them? taking a shower. They're all in my scalp. You see this? You see this? You see this? Every two weeks, Andre receives bottled water from Duke Energy. Tests have shown high levels of heavy metals in her groundwater. Recently, researchers at a nearby university told her they'd found unsafe amounts of arsenic in her soil. When ingested, arsenic has been documented to cause skin rashes. And they called before they even sent the letter. And what'd they say? They said that I had the highest concentration of arsenic in my soil in this area, the whole area. And that's why they were calling me outright. I said, well, I needed that. He said, we're getting ready to send the letter out, but we wanted you to know. Your soil is found to exceed EPA's regional screening levels of 40 milligrams per kilogram for arsenic. When they told you arsenic, what went through your mind? I, I just, like, fell apart. I, I fell apart. Has Duke Energy ever acknowledged that they poisoned your water? Oh, no. They have to pay if they do that. No, I have to document and prove out of my pocket, which I don't have that kind of money. But I'm gonna get it from somewhere or go bankrupt, which I'm almost there. When you think of all this is taken from you, physically and uh, financially, emotionally, how does that make you feel? Thrown away. Don't make me cry. Thrown away because I don't think I should have had to go through this all this time by myself. In September, Scott Pruitt announced the EPA will consider repealing the coal combustion residuals rule at industry's request. He also went ahead and repealed crucial parts of the rule Sutherland's team wrote, which would have ended the disposal of toxic liquid waste and ash in ponds. I, I just don't know if they're going to put anything in its place or just repeal. That hasn't been decided yet. Are Americans being put at risk by this administration? Absolutely. I think public health and safety is going to suffer. And I think uh, that is, is going to be immediate. All the actions they've already taken, again, just at, at the point I left, just seven months into the administration, have uh, enormous public health ramifications already. And we've got, we've really got three and a half more years of repeals ahead of us. The EPA refused our interview request. But Robert Murray, the founder and CEO of the biggest privately owned coal company in America, agreed to speak with us. At my peak in 2013, I had 8,400 jobs in Murray Energy Corporation. Now I'm down to about 6,000 jobs, all due to Democrats, Barack Obama, radical environmentalists, liberal elitists, and yes, those who support windmills and solar panels. How's the Trump administration doing on the list? He's doing very well on it. A donor to Trump's campaign and inauguration, Murray says he's given the president a list of all the regulations he wants repealed including the steam electric effluent guidelines and the coal combustion residuals, or CCR rule. The CCR rule that you're focused on, Joss, is not a major issue in what destroyed the United States coal industry. The Keene Power Plan, the stream protection rule, the subsidy for windmills and solar panels, these rules have also been brought back. Most Americans take for granted that they have clean water to drink or swim or recreate in, or clean air to breathe, or safe food to eat. As you're pushing the EPA to roll back the protections that provide those things, are you willing to trust today's energy companies, petrochemical companies, coal companies, to protect those resources without a, a federal mandate to do so? I don't think Scott Pruitt or President Trump has ever directed anyone to do that. They know they, they have a mandate under our laws to protect the environment. What we have seen, though, is these excesses to pay back their political friends from the Democrats. 
have been done away with. They've rolled back rules that took like 10 years to get in place. They had economic studies, they had scientific studies, they had environmental studies, and then they rolled them back. No, to no, get in you're, place. You're, that's where you're wrong. They weren't protecting anyone. These rules that Mr. Trump and Mr. Perk have overturned relative to the coal industry had no protection on the environment at all. Wait None. A Wait a second. Zero. The very two rules that we've talked about, the fluent limitation guidelines, the coal combustion residuals, these were prompted in part by what happened in Tennessee and the Dan River in North Carolina. No, they weren't. These were rules written to favor certain segments of the society, which were pumping money into the Democrat Party. While it's hard to deny the Trump administration's favors to the fossil fuels industry, the sweeping rollback extends to other powerful companies. Andrew Livers, my friend Andrew, chairman CEO of Dow Chemical Company. Dow Chemical was among the first to feel the benefits. The regulatory burden is for the people behind me and for the great companies of this country and for small companies, an impossible situation. We're going to solve it very quickly. There are a few places Dow's presence can be felt more strongly than in California's Central Valley. The region produces more than a quarter of the country's food, absorbing millions of kilograms of pesticides each year. Among them, chlorpyrifos, an organophosphate manufactured by Dow and commonly sprayed on citrus and other crops. For 24 years, Claudia Angelo has worked in the valley's vineyards and groves. She's raised four children, and early on, she knew her son Isaac was different. Entonces, cuando yo le hablaba, no no me prestaba atención. So desde que estaba muy chiquito, yo me di cuenta que él tenía un problema. Para cuando él tenía cinco años, la escuela me le hizo un estudio en el cual fue con un psicólogo, una enfermera, el doctor y la maestra de la escuela, y llegamos a la conclusión de que tenía ADHD. So ya un doctor firmó el diagnóstico. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, no. Claudia believes that Isaac's Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, is linked to clopyrifos. They live in one of the California counties where the pesticide is most used. Aquí donde yo vivo, las escuelas están prácticamente rodeadas de campos, este, y los niños están expuestos todo el tiempo. Hay casas que están dentro de los uh, campos agrícolas y todos estamos expuestos a esto, los que trabajamos, los que vivimos. So, y, y esa es mi lucha, que, que, eso, que eso pare, porque nuestros niños merecen un mejor lugar donde vivir. En noviembre de 2016, there was hope when the EPA published a proposal to ban clopyrifos. Study after study had shown that clopyrifos is linked to lower IQ, ADHD, and autism in babies who were exposed to it, especially during their mother's pregnancy. And it had been linked to respiratory problems in young children. In 2001, the insecticide had been outlawed for use in American homes. Now, EPA scientists had finally determined that any amount of it was too big a risk to the safety of young children and were banning it for use in agriculture, too. So, Isaac, do you worry about the chemicals that they use around on the plants around here? Ever since I started getting <clears throat> sick, because usually each time I go outside, uh, my eyes hurt a lot, and then my head hurts, then my stomach, and then I get really sick. At school, did they ever talk to you about having trouble concentrating? Yeah. They say that I usually have a off test by the end of the day. Do you ever wonder how life would be different for Isaac were he not exposed to this pesticide? Uh, muy diferente, porque um, su misma condición hace que eh, sea rechazado o causa de burla en las escuelas. Uh, lo toman como un niño problema y bien difícil. So él hubiera tenido una vida normal. Este, podría jugar, tener amigos. Este, en cambio así no tiene muchos amigos. Okay, pues bye.
Environmental organizations that had sued the EPA for years to outlaw chlorpyrifos were sure they'd finally won when the agency published a proposal to ban it. But then in March, Trump's new EPA administrator reversed course, declaring the science not certain enough for a ban and delayed any decision for five more years. Paul Towers works for the Pesticide Action Network. Oh, hi. Hey. Josh Rushing, fault lines. When Trump's EPA chief refused to ban it, it was a surprise uh, to, to all of us that an agency could actually ignore all of that background and all of that science. Well, what does the EPA's own science say about it? Yeah, so EPA's own scientists agree that chlorpyrifos is unsafe in any amount. When they looked at the amount that ends up in water or on the outside of a fruit, particularly on even on the inside of an orange, so it actually migrates through the rind of an orange to the inside of it, that was enough to impact a child's brain so fundamentally that it couldn't be used in any amount. There's like an enormous body of science on, on this one side of it. Did, is, is Pruitt like privy to some other body of science or some other studies on the other side? I think the thing that, that Prude is privy to is a close relationship with the chemical industry. The message that, uh, that Prude put forward is one of uncertainty. And, you know, this is the, the classic cop out. It's a, you know, play out of Big Tobacco's playbook. Anytime you can, let's chalk it up to uncertainty. Researchers from the University of California, Berkeley, have been tracking a group of mothers and kids from California's farm worker communities for almost 20 years. Theirs is one of three major studies that EPA scientists relied on to determine that chlorpyrifos can be toxic to a child's brain. Dr. Kim Harley cautions against waiting for certainty. What studies like ours show is that, on average, mothers who have higher exposure during pregnancy to, to pesticides like this are at higher risk of having children with ADHD. But making that one-to-one -one link back and saying this child's ADHD is caused by this pesticide is something that's it's really almost impossible to do. Is there ever going to be a smoking gun? If you wanted absolute proof, what you would have to do is take a large group of pregnant women and randomize them to have some of them receive a dose of chlorpyrifos and some of them receive a placebo and then see what happens. And Obviously, that's never going to happen. Uh, it's unethical, it's illegal, it's horrible. We wouldn't do that. So if you're waiting for absolute proof, you're not going to find it. So when you look at the body of work that's out there on both sides of this, this issue, how strong is the argument for regulating it? I personally believe that the EPA scientists that reviewed the scientific literature on Cluprifos did an appropriate job. And they came to a conclusion that supported, was supported by science and protected American children. Dow Chemical did not respond to our interview request, but has stated repeatedly that it stands by the safety of chlorpyrifos. In California, there are state rules to limit how close to field workers, schools, daycares, and homes growers can spray potentially harmful pesticides, but they can't prevent mistakes. Just a few weeks after the EPA decided not to ban chlorpyrifos after all, when Nia arrived to work packing cabbages in this Kern County field, Pues a mí se me resecó mi garganta y mucha gente empezó a oler algo muy fuerte, muy que pues nunca habíamos nunca nos había dado ese aroma y ya la gente se empezó a poner mal, a vomitar, unas no podían respirar, les pegó vómito y luego aparte a la gente se le empezó a hormiguear su boca. Eventually the workers were told to go home. One was taken to a hospital. Others were treated by first responders. And did they warn you about the impacts that pesticide could have on children if exposed? No, no nos dijeron nada. California's Department of Pesticide Regulation released a report confirming that chlorpyrifos had drifted from a tangerine field about 800 meters from where Juanillo was working. So did you know before just now that that's what you were poisoned with? Apenas nos dimos cuenta porque en ningún momento nos dijeron nadie. Sí, ellos nos dejaron unas tarjetitas, pero nunca nos dijeron qué fue lo que nosotros respiramos ese día. No, en ningún momento nos dijeron nada. To run the EPA's Office of Chemical Safety and Pollution Prevention, Trump has nominated a chemical industry consultant who, under contract to Dow, found a safety threshold for clopyrifos many times less protective than the EPA's own. 
If confirmed, he'll be one of many former industry insiders now in leadership positions at the EPA. And the rollback has just begun. The Trump administration is saying is that once there's a change in a political party, the new party in charge gets to determine what is science and what is engineering and what is economic fact. This executive order is one of many ways we're going to get real results when it comes to removing job-killing regulations and unleashing economic opportunity. The havoc that's being wreaked in environmental protection now is going to take a decade or more to, to undo. Should I give this pen to Andrew? Dow Chemical. <laughs> I, I think maybe, right? Yeah, so. I'm very proud of this one.